Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to our Edge in Education. I'm just here to briefly welcome you all. You uh, may know if you've been attending regularly that this is probably a record uh, attendance uh, for Edge in Education, which we're really excited about. And um, I know it's not because of the food, even though we have an amazing spread of food. Uh, there's food on both sides, and you should feel free during the session. Uh, if the, uh, if the uh, urge grabs you, get up and uh, get some coffee or, or something to eat. That's why it's there. Uh, and, uh, but I just wanted to frame uh, this conversation and also the, the theme of uh, these edge and educations. We talk about the fact that it is crucial for a school like ISP that is pushing forward in the best interests of kids on many different levels that parents are involved, not on the sidelines, uh, not finding out about things later, but are partners in what we do uh, with education. It's extremely important to us because we can't make the progress and we can't serve the kids well if parents are not partners. And they, people don't always agree with everything we're doing, but that debate uh, and that uh, constructive criticism is appreciated as well. Uh, and um, that's the purpose of the Edge in Education and the purpose of this whole series. We're really excited to have uh, Rosalind Weissman and Charlie Kuhn here. They've been working uh, with faculty and kids uh, for the past few days and it's been an invigorating, a dynamic uh, interaction and hopefully there's been a lot of learning about it. Hopefully you've heard maybe from your kids when they've uh, come home uh, if they've interacted with them about some of the things that have happened. So we're excited to, to have her here, but I'm actually going to ask our associate principal, uh, Matt Smith, uh, to do the formal introduction, but enjoy the Edge in Education. Thank you. Thanks, Arnie. Uh, we're extremely excited to have Rosalind Wiseman here as well as her uh, business partner, Charlie Kuhn, who's been working with our kids some parents and our teachers over the last few days. And really this visit started uh, last spring in preparation for these three days here. Um, it's also included conversations with some of our kids before they came. They've read through all of our accreditation reports, all of our handbooks, and spent a lot of time really trying to understand our community to make sure that this visit is tailored to our specific culture in our school. So just a few words about Rosalind. Um, she's a New York Times bestselling author uh, and educator. Um, her first work, her seminal work, uh, Queen Bees and Wannabes, uh, was a New York Times bestseller and became the basis for the film, film Mean Girls, uh, which is now a Broadway uh, musical as well. Uh, her follow-up to that was Masterminds and Wingmen. Uh, she's also written books called The Guide. Uh, and many of these are about helping kids navigate and helping parents navigate the years of adolescence and, and teenage life. Um, in addition to that, a few years ago, um, she's a co-founder of uh, the business cult, uh, creating a culture of dig or cultures of dignity. Sorry, uh, with her partner partner Charlie Kuhn, and really their job or what they're trying to do is help communities, school communities, shift thinking on work with adolescents, and that's what a lot of their work has been uh, over the past few days. So I'll let Rosalind tell, her, uh, tell a little bit more about herself, but uh, help me in welcoming Rosalind Wiseman. Thank you, Matt. All right, I, I don't think I need it. I don't think so. Good morning. Why are you people here? <laughs> My goodness. Um, so I've had an opportunity to meet some of you over the last couple of days. Um, this is an extraordinary community. Um, I feel like I'm actually getting uh, nervous about what happens after I leave here in a few hours because I haven't not had ISP in my life for the last year or so. So um, I wanna thank all of the administrators who have been with us on this path, getting um, us ready to be here. And the people in the back are really extraordinary people. Um, and, and truly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like calling Matt and Teresa like, hi, 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 what, what else can we do? Um, and so it's really been a partnership and a collaboration. And I've had the also the and the, here's another fabulous person um, <laughs> who said some awesome wisdom to us last night. Um, where you know that it's just wonderful to sit with a group of colleagues and educators and people say, well, these are the things that I do. And you're like, oh my gosh, what a great idea. So it's really been um, an extraordinary opportunity to be here. And Charlie is right next door giving um, to the grade. T uh, team leaders um, next steps. 
So we are going to leave and we're giving the school a lot of information of how to move forward and things that the school's already doing. So, but what I'm here to do today is to answer your questions about probably things like, my child does not get off a fortnight and I'm going to kill him. <laughs> or um, is Instagram as bad as I think it is? Um, yes, it is. Um, and uh, so what I'm here to do is to be able to give you some concrete ways of looking at the lives of our young people. And my understanding is, is that we have a whole range of people here. So we have people who have children in elementary school. Can you raise your hand so I get a sense of that? Like your, the cute children? Okay, and then the middle school people? Sweet, all right, and upper school people? That's awesome, I have upper school people and like you are not jaded and you are still, you're probably jaded, but you're still here and you're like, yes, I'm gonna keep learning. <laughs> I'm really, that deeply, that's deeply respectful to me because I just came from being with my children you know, for Thanksgiving and honestly, I don't know about you all, for those of you who celebrate Thanksgiving, but I honestly had moments, <laughs> like many moments of I deeply do not like my children. I deeply, deeply do not like them. So, um, so with that, let's talk about how much, you know, it's so great to be, to be a parent and what can we do um, to really be the best that we can be as far as being able to, to guide them through this process. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna also show you what we did here. So we've got a big agenda um, and I want you to be able to ask me whatever questions that you've got. So, hi, good morning, thank you for coming. Really, thank you for coming. So doesn't this sort of look like where we are a little bit? Not right now, but like I'm assuming it's more green and it's not November. So this is this cliche, right? It takes a village to raise a child. And I'm actually not a big fan of cliches because it doesn't talk about how complex things are. And villages are complicated. Like there are crazy people in your village. <laughs> there are people who really have vastly different opinions about things, especially about kids. So really, I wanna think about this in terms of the village is complicated. We have this thing about it takes a village to raise a child. It does, but it is complex. And I want us to think about these village moments. Like what does it mean to actually have a village moment where you are supporting each other? And so that's really the spirit in which I want us to think about this. Now, particularly for some of you, you have, you have families where you are moving quite a bit. And that, I know people, I think a parent asked me yesterday, like what is, what do you think is the biggest difference for international schools versus other schools? And what I, what I can sense from my experience in international schools is that the making of friendships and what that means when you get to a school is different. And how families, the anxiety that a family, under, a parents would understandably feel about, I want my child to land somewhere where they can feel a part of something that that really, that's an anxiety that I could really share. I can really put myself in that feeling. And at the same time also, when you moved somewhere else, how do they leave those friendships? And how do you guide them through that process? How do you do that when you get to a place? So for you all, there's I think a little bit of complexity and nuance about this that maybe some people who don't, who are not having so much uh, fluidity in their village that they don't have. And so that can exacerbate, it can intensify, I think, some of the friendship issues that young people have. Um, it also, of course, gives them a benefit of being more fluid and being able to move in different social groups and dynamics. So there's positives and negatives. So what did we do here, by the way? I just wanted to give you a sense of what we did here. So we met with the leadership team. We met with all of the people who teach health. We met with all the counselors. We met with the SCA. We met, we hung out, I hung out with grades 11 and 12. That was hilarious. Um, I met with ninth and 10th grade in this. I met with the grade nine in this room. Um, Charlie met with the 10th grade. We met yesterday afternoon. Charlie worked with the sixth graders for two hours. I met with the seventh and eighth graders for two hours. We did give them a break. Um, we met with faculty after that. We met with parents, that's you people right now, and we are um, talking to the grade team directors. That's what we've done since we've been here. Um, I'll tell you a little bit, because we didn't have an opportunity to actually officially talk to the grades 11 and 12, but what I did, because Teresa suggested I do it, is we had a little bit of free time, and she said, go up to the senior lounge. And so I, I went up to the senior lounge, and you know, senior lounges are intimidating. They are, I don't care, like, I, you know, so I go up there and I'm like, it's their space, and it's like, and they're looking at me like, 
I don't know who you are and what are you doing here? <laughs> and I sort of sat down like a little edge on the couch and I was like, hi, <coughs> hi, I'm Rosalind. I'm here, I'm gonna be working with the other younger students. We, I'd really like to get your advice. I had one young woman who was extraordinarily beautiful, super, super chic, and immediately I feel like I'm 14. She looks at me <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm like, Ugh. and then she, and then she you know, sort of tolerates me for about a minute and then she gets up and leaves. I was like, that's not going well. And then <laughs> I had a couple of other kids who were being very polite, who were being polite, and they started talking to me. And then all of a sudden, it was like a feeding frenzy. It was, I had as many students, as many seniors, and a few juniors around me in the student lounge as possible. It was completely packed. And they were talking to me about, a couple, about various things, advice that they would give to grades 9 and 10, what it was like to be a senior here, um, managing anxiety, wanting what their social lives were like, what they needed. And so it was a really, really awesome, awesome experience. And the young woman that was, you know, sir, who left, she actually came back. And I would say, it was like she was like a shark, like circled around. And I was watching, I was like, oh boy, what's gonna, right? She sat down and, and then said some incredibly wonderful insights. So it was really a wonderful moment. And so that was my grades 11 and 12. Um, lots of laughing, I laughed. One of them, no, one of them asked me three times if I was wearing a wire. I actually had to get up and do this. <laughs> I swear to you that happened. So whoever son that is, you're in trouble. Um, <laughs> he was so charming. Uh, so your children are, for the like, really so charming. Okay, which is a pro positive and a negative, by the way, right? I'm not just saying, oh, they're so charming. That's so great. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's a positive and a negative, because they know exactly what to say to us. Where we're like, oh, that's great. Things are cool. Wonderful, right? Okay. All right. So. Now I'm going to show you some of the building blocks of how I approach our work and how we approach the work with um, young people also. So here's how we define happiness because the parents sometimes, I think they fall into two groups, categories. One is, is I want my child to be happy, right? I want my child to be happy. That's what I want. And the other kind of parent is like, I don't care if they're happy. I just want them to learn and like grow up to take care of stuff. And I would like for us to be able to handle both and think about both. But what is, how do you define happiness? So happiness is that you have meaning beyond oneself, you have purpose, you have a hope of success, which is not a guarantee, that you have meaningful social connections. So I was pushing on all of the girls at the school that Instagram posts are not meaningful connections. There are lots of things on social media that are meaningful connections. Uh, Instagram post where you are taking a picture of yourself that you fuss over for, to make sure it's the perfect look with the pilfer, perfect filter with the perfect this to then post and then your girlfriends underneath it have to say, oh my God, you're so cute, you're so cute, you're so cute, you're so cute, you're so cute. That is not meaningful. So that's, some, that's one of the messages that we delivered to grades seven through 10 at this school in the last couple of days. Uh, you have satisfying work, which is you're curious, and that you have a place to process and find peace. That is how we define happiness. Now, this piece right here, this one right here, is very challenging for schools like yours. And that means I include schools like you because this is a place that demands high expectations and high everything, constant, constant, like achievement, achievement to your best, to your best, to your best. That is exhausting. So it is really important for everybody in the community, everyone in the community, parents, faculty, staff, students, to have a place to process and find peace. It's really important. And in communities like this one, it is, can be very difficult. You can, it's easy, excuse me, to lose sight of that. So I'm gonna push on you a little bit of things to carry with you overall. Now, by the way, talking about Fortnite, a good video game does all of these things, <laughs> except for the, fifth, except for the uh, fifth one. A good, why are people so addicted to Fortnite? And why are they so addicted to some kinds of games? Because it really does actually satisfy these four things. So that might seem odd to you when you're looking at like blood all over the screen, and that's not Fortnite, but it's truly, it truly is, and that's why it's so meaningful for people. Okay, the other part though, and this is true, is that we have conflict and we have things called bullying and drama. Now, bullying is a very loaded word for students. So I asked you the seventh, grade seventh and eighth yesterday, 
if for, to raise their hand that if they had thought I was a bully, they were coming to me to do a bullying prevention program, would they have dreaded the program? And the vast majority of them raised their hand. Now there are a couple of reasons why, and it is uh, one of the reasons why is because people overuse the term. So I'm going to define what it is, and then we're going to piece it apart because words are really important to know, like, what is it? What is it? And also, what is the context? So bullying, the, of the definition of it is, is repeatedly abusing or threatening to abuse power against another person. It is saying you don't have the right, basically, to exist because of what we perceive you to be, which is why bullying uh, consistently goes to the essence of people or their p the perception of those people, from their ability to their ethnicity, religion, the color of their skin, to their sexual orientation, gender expression, socioeconomic class. Those kinds of things of who you are identified to be, and bullying is about saying you don't have the right to do that. You don't have the right to be that. And we have the right to take your dignity away because we perceive you that way. That is why bullying is a big deal for schools, because it is really about how you create a safe place in a school to learn. You can be uncomfortable in a school, but you cannot be unsafe. If you're unsafe, you cannot learn. So but drama is different. Drama is a conflict that's serious to the people involved, but not taken seriously by other people being entertained by it. So this is hurtful for children. This will stop them from being able to remember how to conjugate in German or Spanish or all of the different languages that you can learn here. But it is not bullying. And the problem is, is that oftentimes when we talk to young people about bullying, it is said it comes across as one person is 100% evil and one person is 100% innocent. It is true that that can happen. It is true. But if we only talk about it like that, then kids disengage from us because they're like, I know that this stuff is going both ways. And it, we've heard about it. This school is not, is not different from any other school. We have heard, just like we heard other schools, that there are kids who've gotten into conflicts with each other where you look at something and you're like, oh, that's horrible, right? And it is horrible. And you also find out that there's also been things going both ways. Now, it, so th these things are complicated, and so being able to put words to it and context to it makes young people engage. They will not engage if you come across as very simplistic. You just won't. Especially, I mean, not all kids are like this, but your kids really are pretty sophisticated. They will disengage if you come across as being very simplistic. So, and it's, it comes across as patronizing. So it's really important that when you have people come and talk about bullying or you talk about this in any capacity, it reflects that, kind, that, that sophistication. That is true for all students, frankly. So this is important to, to be able to distinguish between the two. The last thing, and I'm gonna refer to this a little bit later, is that one of the things that does not happen, it happens so rarely when we talk about bullying, is that when we, when we talk to young people, is that we do not talk about their experiences of witnessing or experiencing directly when an adult abuses power and that they see that. So I will speak for my native country of the United States that there is, I, and I have never had anybody push back on me about this, that if you're a child in the United States who is participating in any kind of athletic endeavor in a competitive way, you have seen adults act abominably. You have seen coaches, parents, referees act abominably. So I have two very athletic uh, sons who are doing competitive stuff. I am so torn about their participation in it because of the absolute horrible poor role modeling that they consistently see by adults. So we have to own this because if we own it, then young people will talk to us. If we don't, they disengage. So to that end, I want to show you um, that it's really important to know that conflict is inevitable. It just is, even in beautiful schools with great reputations like yours. If you have no conflict in your life, one of two things is true. You are dead or you are not paying attention to the people around you. You are not. That includes coming here. So for those of you who, when you move a lot, and you're like, oh my gosh, setting, getting my children set in school is the most important thing. I got to find the school. I'm going to go talk to people I know at the next city who's like, okay, this is the school I should send my child to. That school is going to have issues just like every other school. But I certainly understand the feeling of, I need to find a school so my kids can be okay. I totally get that. So if we, can, if we remember that conflict is inevitable and what the definition of happiness is, it helps us get through these hard times. Okay. Now, 
this was one of the best, I wanted to show this to you because this was one of the most fun and really helpful exercises we did with the students that we worked with here. So in preparation, as Matt said, we did phone calls with groups of students to ask them what we needed to do. We advised, we, we got their advice about how to prepare when we were working with them. So we asked, so we then came up with, because we work with their people their age, and we came up with a set of questions and we came to them and said, okay, we don't, we're not going to assume to know your life, so we're going to ask you a series of questions. If you've said yes to this, and just to imagine you are, are all now grade seven and eight, wait, grade nine, because I had about 90 of them or 80 of them or something a couple days ago. If you can say yes to this experience, I want you to stand up and sit down. And you could see, and I did it with the grade seven and eight yesterday, Grade nine in particular, their eyes were going so fast sideways as soon as I said it. I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, right? And I was like, all right, everyone, stare at your table. Stare at your table. And they're, they're actually very cooperative people, like in this kind of a venue. I don't know, for those of you of grade nines, I'm guessing you might not have that experience all the time at home. But they did listen to me when I said, look at the table. And so these were the questions that we asked. Um, this is a combination of what we asked eights and nines. Have you ever been unfairly blamed for something? So this is a gimme, basically, to most of the boys in the room, because they're going to think once this gets up there, they're like, oh my god, you're speaking to me, right? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm speaking to pretty much everybody, but that's cool. So have you ever been unfairly blamed for something? If you can say yes, get up and sit down. Everybody was up? Pretty much everybody was up. I didn't see anybody down, say it that way. Um, have you ever felt tired? Do you feel tired because you're trying to keep up all the time? For the high school people, we added, do you feel tired trying to keep up all the time, but you always feel that you're falling behind? Almost at like <coughs> huge, vast majority of kids got up. Have you heard a racist, sexist, homophobic insult, joke, or comment? You didn't like it, but you didn't say anything. Vast majority of your students got up. Have you done something incredibly stupid and had no idea why you did it? <laughs> Everybody in my, gr in my group yesterday got up. Um, have you had to put up with someone making little annoying comments that you hate and they know you hate? Most people got up. Have you liked someone really wanted to tell them but had no idea how? This was brilliant. Yesterday with grade eight, I had a boy get up so fast <laughs> and everybody was like, and I was like, we just had this moment of like, good for you for being so courageous. Um, do you need to apologize to someone? many kids got up. And then actually in my grade nines, I had to remind them that they can't say, hey, you need to do that, right? <laughs> like, I was like, you need to focus on yourself, stare at your table. Um, have you felt like you had to choose between friends? This is a huge issue, huge issue for people here. Been so angry that you wanted to explode but didn't say anything, and come to school pretending you were fine but were really feeling the opposite. So what we did, just so you know, because we're really big believers and we, want to, we can be here for several days and we would love to come back, but we might not. And we want to give you things to go with. And so one of all of the grades did is we asked them, what are we missing? And so one of the exercises that they did was that they wrote down their own questions. And so now we have several hundred of their own questions that I just gave to Matt, who's going to scan them all, and then we're going to use that going, the school can use that going forward to frame how they do this kind of content. Because if we come in and talk about empathy and kindness and bullying, your children will check out. They will check out. If we talk about it like this, they will engage. So the other thing that I did, and I got permission, I got permission from the grade nines, like 100%. If one kid had said no, I would have said no. I asked them when they came in. Um, they had two things on, on flip chart paper they had to answer. One was here, and it said, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do people get into people's business in your grade? And some people said 20,000. Um, I was like, 1 to 10. Um, but I also said to them, what are things that adults don't understand about people at, the, at your age? So I got their permission to, show, to keep one of them, to show you one of them, because I thought it was so funny. Some of them were so funny. So this is one of the things that they said. And, and remember, this is grade nine. So somebody said, we like eggs. It's like super random. I'm sure there's a big, d profound story behind that. I don't know what it is. Um, they don't understand our personalities. They don't understand why we use technology. The technology that we grew up with, grades, we're all different. We, they? You. Yeah. They is you. <laughs> they hate tech. <laughs> School is not easy. School is actually hard. Homework takes a lot of time. 
we're fi that we're 15. That's all I'd like you to remember. <laughs> Drama, and this is my favorite one, we're just mad at you. It's not the hormones. <laughs> I actually took a picture of this. This, this right here, I will always remember. Um, we want to have fun, that's all. And our humor isn't that pure anymore. It's also ranking pretty high up there with me about how funny that is. So we're just mad at you, actually. It's not our hormones. OK. Um, so we're asking you, we took pictures, by the way, you can, please take pictures. And I can send you slides of this too. So I wanted to provide you a context for what we're doing. And now I'm going to share with you then, well, what do we do about it from your perspective, from the, what you do? <coughs> so we, I think it's really important to define, this is especially true for people who are, have younger children, what is teasing? Because teasing is this huge concept and people get away with bad behavior. And in the grade six, seven, and eight, we defined exactly for them what this is. And then they came up with their own examples. So bonding teasing is you feel liked, you don't feel put down, and basically the person understands your line. I want you to think about this for families too. Um, annoying teasing is the person maybe doesn't know how you feel, but they're also really good at saying some variation that silences you. Like, I was just joking, relax. Malicious teasing is you're teased for what you're insecure about, you're uptight or threatened with the association, somehow the relationship, and it is relentless and in public, which includes social media. So the way that I look at it, because remember I work with boys a lot, is that there can be the roasting culture that happens of one-upping each other and being rude to each other. This is, what, this is where this gets confusing for them, because first of all, it feels like if we're friends, then you can be able to do anything to me, which actually what we've said to them is actually if you're friends, even more so, you should know what the boundaries are. Second is that it feels like you can't take it. You're, the ethos of high performing schools and of the students and families who attend them can really be about I, can ju I just have to take it. I, just, I always am able to handle whatever is coming at me. And so, the thing, so what happens is, is that it feels like if it's all teasing, then you never get to a place of like, I can't take it, I don't like it, because then you're gonna get more ridiculed for not being able to take it. This is particularly challenging for boys, particularly challenging for boys that they should be able to take it, because roasting and how you, or how you go after somebody and how sarcastic you are and how fast you are with a, with a response gives you social currency, ups your social higher, your social status. It has always been important in boy culture to be funny and to be sort of nasty funny. It has always been the case, always been the case. When you give your boys a cell phone, a smartphone, one of the first things that my experience with boys is that they do and they get, I don't care how old they are, is that they will look at the top 10 dirty jokes, top 10 fast, that's what they do. It's one of the first things they do. So, What's important about that is, is that we get to a place where young people can't speak out when they don't like something. The line keeps moving of what they do, of, of like, when, when, when do I say something? And they haven't said anything, and then all of a sudden, and this is what we talked about a lot with middle school, what I did with the seventh and eighth grade, is that you sit on things, you sit on things, you sit on things, and then you explode. And then people look at you like, why are you exploding about this little tiny thing? That's crazy. And then you feel embarrassed about doing that because you've lost control. But what you really are doing is you're upset about all the stuff that came before it. So what we want to do, and this is why social emotional learning is so important for young people and how it connects to their abilities in school, is if they can recognize when it's happening and then be able to have avenues to communicate those feelings to themselves, and then if necessary, be able to identify who they need to talk to, then they don't get to the place of explosion and they're not carrying, literally like carrying the stress of, of this feeling of what is this person going to say to me and I have a math test that I'm really stressed about and my, my parent really wants me to do well on because they really want me to be an engineer because that's really important. So it's all of this stuff comes at them and it makes it very difficult for them but how are they going to put words to that? That is very difficult because also if they put words to it, the problem is you might ask them more questions. Right? And then there'd be like a lot of parenting questions. And parenting questions are just overwhelming. So it's just better to just not say anything because parents are going to say things like, well, where were you when this happened? Well, what did the person say? Well, what did you say in response? Well, was the teacher there? Well, what did the teacher say? And the child's like, I, 
uh, 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 and they're like, well, I'm going to call the school. And you're like, oh my God, why did I answer? Why did I tell her anything? This is the worst idea in the world. So if just I want you to feel it from their perspective of how overwhelming this can feel to them. And you're just feeling when you get this little glimpse of like information, you want to help them, right? You want to help them because you're a parent, so you're helpful. You're not helpful. You are super stressful because it's like, how am I going to answer all these questions to this person? Because I can barely remember what happened. And if I don't get it right, and by the way, for those of you who went to law school, you are even worse because you are like focused on the actual answers and the kid, right? So it's stressful. It's okay. So this is important for middle school people and for all, for really all of us to be able to know the difference between. Oh, I don't know. Let's see. Okay, you can ask a question. Go ahead. How to turn uh, from stressful parent to helpful parent? Oh, I'm on that. Don't worry. The question is, how do you go from stressful parent to helpful parent? I promise you I'm not going to talk about how terrible we are and then go, bye-bye. <laughs> see you later. <laughs> okay. Um, that's not cool. That, is, that would not be cool. Okay. So here, so I promise you I will do that. So the next, let me just make sure about something. Yeah. So I'm going to do a little bit more of making us, us stressed, and then we're going to go forward, OK? So I want to just put out here a couple things about social media. The average parent will post 1,000 pictures of their child by the time they are two years of age. I actually looked to see if this was a made-up survey. This is not, because I had a hard time believing it. I actually looked it up. True. This is insane. No, this is insane. So your children are adorable. They are. They really are. I have to say, your children are truly adorable. But we do not need to be posting everything that they do all the time. We don't. We really do not. And we particularly, please hear me about this, that if your child says to you, mom, dad, don't take my picture, do not take their picture. It, this is, a, for me, a consent issue. And also, think about this, right? Because we want to be able to be, be building your child's boundaries about what is recorded and what is not. That includes us. So when, I, and our child is sometimes going through a time when they feel incredibly self-conscious about their face, about their body, about whatever, we think they look adorable. But through their lens, their perspective, they are feeling self-conscious, yet we are taking pictures of them constantly and then posting it publicly. So that is tough. So I would just ask you, if they say, mom, don't take my picture, dad, don't take my picture, don't take the picture. And do not post that picture without their consent. All right. The other part is we're posting everything, and then we also can become across as very fear-based. And people don't learn from fear. They don't. So here's what we do. This is what we did with some of your students. And we also are recommending to the school that this is an area that needs to be more integrated into the curriculum of the school. So media literacy and about how you interpret social media into your life is critical. So I'm going to give you a couple of things on this. Number one, this is huge. This is Instagram. So what we asked your students is, so when you post something on social media, who are you pleasing? Who do you imagine is going to be looking at your post? And, and also, if you know, if you only, you only know, if you can only know about 50 to 100 people, but you've got 600 people or 1,000 people or 400,000 people following you, you are giving them tremendous amounts of power if the people that you don't know and don't have investment in you can comment about you however they want. So Instagram is real. Instagram, the research is showing that Instagram is absolutely the worst for boys and girls' body image. Of all the social media platforms, Instagram is the worst because it is a, literally a walking billboard of your advertising, of like you as a billboard, you as an advertisement. So Instagram is on, it's like, your, it's like your public face, which is why young people, if they have a private Instagram called Finstas, that, which is weird because that's a fake Instagram account, which actually is more private, which is actually more real, that is where they're putting more of their private information like Snapchat. Okay, so the invisible audience, young people need to understand that they are tr pleasing the invisible audience with their own posts of social media. Next is it's about FOMO, about fear of missing out. We know from our work with high school people that Snapchat and Snap Map, where they can see their friends on Snap Map, is making them feel like, and it's, this is, you can look at this and think this is ridiculous, but this is true, is that they're looking at Snap Map and saying, this is, I'm not there, I'm not there, I'm not there, I'm not there. 
So I said to the high school people in my presentations with them, it is okay to be an introvert. It is okay. You don't have to be on all the time. You do not have to be on all the time. You can say, I can't, I'm I need to be quiet. And they need to be able to talk about this feeling because they feel it. They feel it and they know that it's crazy, but they're still being really motivated by it. Um, oh yeah, I had an intern do this, so she had to do a gift for me. So this is, I wanna be where the people are. I need to be where the people are. Here's the other, here's my last thing, which I did not go over with um, your students, but, but, um, but I do wanna go over with you, which is the norm, it's the norm of people's entertainment is other people's embarrassment and humiliation. I actually did do this a little bit with the ninth grade, but this is important. As a parent, you know, there's gonna be different kinds of social media platforms, there's gonna be different kinds of, all different kinds of stuff about technology. The big norm that we, as, as with our family values that I'm asking you to break, is that people's entertainment is not other people's embarrassment. So I'm gonna give you one village moment about this. So, yours, so I don't know specifically, but I have not gone to a school in the world, in the world, without somebody, some child in seventh or eighth grade, usually, who's taking some kind of naked picture or sexually inappropriate picture or video and sending it to somebody. Um, all schools are dealing with it. They just are. I haven't come across any school that hasn't. And when I talked about that in my grade nines, it got super quiet. And if you know grade nine, it's not a quiet grade. It got very quiet. So it was very engaged, super awesome. We are having a great time. When I started talking about this, it was like, whew. okay. Now here's, the, what I, here's what I said and here's what I think is important, which is that it is not unethical to fall in love, to want attention, to uh, want eyeballs on your social media because the entire culture is telling you that. It is not unethical. It is not unethical, it is, it is not like wrong, wrong to do those things. Because you're a teenager, you're developing up in this world, in a world that's constant on this medium, and when you're a teenager, you want affirmation, you want to be seen as attractive, you want p positive peer affirmation. It is part of their wiring. It's also part of all of our wiring. And so it, it is also when somebody says you're beautiful and I want a picture of you, or I love you and I want a picture of you, it is not unethical to send that picture. It is unethical to get that picture and forward it. Yet we mostly focus, when this stuff comes up, we mostly focus on the person, usually a girl, who send that picture. And we shame the girl and we don't hold the kids responsible for the people, boys and girls, who have forwarded the picture. The other part is, is that boys also send pictures. They do. They send, if for the most part, why we know more about girls is because it becomes more fodder, more public, Boys are sending pictures of their genitals, and they think it's really funny. Like eighth grade boys, some eighth grade boys think it is hilarious to do that to their friends, to other people. Like truly, it is high comedy to do that. It's tr so, the problem is, is that you're only seeing this much of the person. And you, you don't know if that's that person's genitals or if they took somebody's phone and took the pictures and was like, oh, this is funny. Let me grab his phone because his backpack's right there. I'm going to drop it down my pants, take a picture, and put it back, right? You don't know. And these, you know, these administrators, right, you, you, can you imagine as a parent, you find out that your very lovely ninth grade daughter, eighth grade daughter, uh, whatever, has been sent a picture of somebody's genitals. And, you, and it's there, and you can see it's coming from this particular person. So you go to the school, totally understandably, and say, that kid better get out of this school. Right? He just sent a picture to my daughter of his genitals. And the administrator really actually has to say to you, I'm not sure who that really is. I actually have to do my due diligence to figure out <laughs> what is going on. That is what they are, have to spend their time, some of their time doing sometimes. It is crazy town. It, like, they did not get into this work. Artie, I don't think you got into this work. Artie, I don't think you got into this work to do this. And yet heads of schools and assistant principals and everybody's got to be doing this. Like, look at Matt. He's a very nice guy. Look at that. He has to deal with this kind of stuff, just like every other person has to. <laughs> I just want you to have some compassion for when you go into Arnie's office and you're like, I need this done. 
And really, truly, a head of school has to say, I need, the, I need some time. I need a place to process and figure out what's going on. Because if you don't discipline appropriately and you discipline incorrectly, then the kid who got away with it, his social status goes way up amongst the kids because they got one over on the school. And the child who got in trouble very likely is not going to roll because if they roll, if they snitch, if they tell, then there's going to be huge blowback. There's going to be huge consequences on them from their peers. And this is the last thing, and we'll move to like how we can make it better. Is amount, so when I said to you, anxiety for kids coming into new places, it's harder to be able to establish boundaries. Loyalty and doing that and being able to go with like, oh my gosh, if I don't say anything, then I get more approval from my peers. I'm trying to make friends as fast as possible. That's a challenge, right? It's an additional challenge. So that it is, whether you like it or not, that's basically what being a, t a parent today is about. Not, not all of your children are doing this, but I, I'm pretty sure that the majority of your students, if they have not physically done it themselves, that they have interacted with people or they're walking down the hallway or, or at somebody's house and walking out the school and they're like, oh my gosh, did you see what happened? Right? Did you see this? Did you see that? So they are in some way interacting with these issues. Okay. So now where I see, that's it. We can all like, <laughs> okay. Uh, now we're going to go better, okay? So, and you also please ask questions as we go. So I think that there's a couple of things that are really helpful for me. I also did this with the kids in various ways, which is to be very clear about what these words mean. Can I just ask you, mm -hmm. regarding the photos, how much those photos or these kind of, let's say, inappropriate images or whatever, how much does that fall into the teasing category? Then? Oh, good question. Good question. So how much does the um, photos fall into the teasing category? So the boys' genitals pictures could absolutely fall into all three of those categories. Because if they're sending it even to each other's, you know, uh, it's kind I, of a joke because maybe they're making some comparison. You know, it's do you have boys? <laughs> you have boys, I have boys. Yes, yes, yes. They actually, we do live in a world, they actually, true, very true, and it is true, it is true that I could imagine, I absolutely can see that boys are feeling like they are connecting to their friends because they think it's funny to do that. Absolutely. I, I, yeah, I could see it. And then there's like this other added thing which maybe then it's taken to, it's a sexual preference, you know, because it's a Absolutely. And they must be gay. So right, exactly. Immediate. Exactly. And now let me, and then let me say also, so we all, this school has technology policies like m most schools. And it also has this up discipline policy, which like most schools that say the things that you do outside of school that affect the school, we have the right to discipline. This is why it gets so confusing because on this issue, I'm not even talking about partying. It's that, so what if this child, right, does this, does it impact the school? But he did it where they were hanging out playing Fortnite on your, in your living room, right? And that you're not an irresponsible parent and this happened, you were right there. You were making snacks for them. You were making them hot cocoa, and they were doing this upstairs while they were playing their games, right? So I want to be really cl also clear about let, we need to pull one of the village moments is actually not is being really really clear and focused when we are ten, having a tendency to blame of like where was that parent? Because the where was that parent? In in many cases, the parent was right upstairs, like doing their best. It could. It could. It could. They're experimenting with, okay, like, they could. It's funny, but it can also be really horrible. So, pranks, right. Pranks in Boy World, here's the problem that I want you to, that's, I think, the most important takeaway for me about pranking, and, and this is pranking in some ways, is that because boys cannot ever say, this crossed the line for me, because if they do, then, that, then they become emasculated that they are very predisposed, they are very conditioned to accept behavior that is not okay. And so one of the things that we as parents need to do is say, if you think something is not funny, you have the right to think it is not funny. And by the way, in our families, if we have a family member who says, I am mocking you, and that's the, how I show that I love you, or I only do that to people I love or people in my family, Mocking is a, one of those small abuses of power, which is, I don't care how you feel about what I'm doing. My right to do this to you is more important than the fact that you feel uncomfortable. Now, I'm not saying that kids, kids need to deal with people that are obnoxious. People, kids need to deal with being offended. People are not gonna die by being offended. Please hear me. I think like, that's important. 
but it is we let those kinds of things happen sometimes not all I'm what I'm saying is we need to be mindful of them and I'm going to show you how I am mindful of them so I think these two words are really important so dignity means to be worthy all of the students that we've worked with have gotten this all of them dignity is a given it is to be worthy it is that people have the inherent right to be treated with an essential value and treated ethically now dignity does not get actually in English does not get a lot of gravitas does not got a lot does not get a lot of respect we don't use it as much but dignity is a very powerful word because you can't people might try and take it away from you but it is a given respect differently is earned based on your position and your actions so respect is coming from looking at someone's behavior now what is really difficult is that Respect has been conflated, has been combined into the meaning these two things, which is recognizing a status difference and recognizing the value of a person like dignity. So we have been raised, and many people here are from so many different ethnicities, cultures, all that. One of the things in many of our cultures is, is to respect your elders, to respect teachers. That is very important. That is based on respecting the work that the person did, the effort, the sacrifice that they did, to be able to do this. Like, I hope you would respect me because you know that I did a lot of work to do my best for you all. So that is the work that I have done to have my position. And I believe very strongly as a mother of two very obnoxious 15 and 17 year old boys who do not stop arguing that they need to respect me as their mother. That is incredibly important to me. It is incredibly important to me that I'm respected as a teacher. None of that takes away from the fact that there are people who use those positions to abuse power. And so we have a crisis around the word respect, not just for those of us who are from the United States, because we're sort of the easy people right now to look at, but you UK people, right, with people all around the world, actually. We, I shouldn't be doing anything to anybody with any country. All around the world, we are struggling with this. And I, one of the ways in which it affects young people is that young people are disengaging from this conversation. And one of the reasons why, it's basically like, I will not give you respect until I get respect from you. And people who are older don't like that, understandably. So what I, all I want to do is I want to, uh, what I'm highlighting is, and what we're saying to young people is, you don't have to, we're to if somebody is acting in ways that you don't think are respectful, if they're taking away people's dignity, then you don't have to respect their actions, but you must treat that person with dignity. So that way you can be with a person who's in a position of power or authority, treat them with dignity, but you don't in your mind feel like you are treating them with respect. Because when that happens, we, what, and here's two things. One is the person who's in the weaker position feels like the person in position of authority is getting away with it and it makes them angry. And for young people, it builds and builds and builds and builds, and then they disengage also from schools. It's actually one of the biggest reasons why kids disengage from schools, from sports, from teams, from anything. Kids will work so hard, so hard for a teacher or coach that they respect, like truly respect, because that person has shown them dignity. So we need to be, these words are important and they're powerful. And so we can think about in our cultures what gives us the strength to be able to talk about these kinds of conversations with our children. Okay, now here's like bullets, like if I had to distill it, how do you do it? Here's the things that I would think about. I do this as a teacher, but it really helps me as a parent because parenting, it just is more, it's just harder to manage yourself. So I want you to remember that it's a moment, not a lifetime, either horrible moments this is more important sometimes than horrible moments but frankly it's just as important with like amazing moments when people are like oh my gosh you're kidding you're like yes my child <laughs> instead of they like no, i don't know that child not my child so remember that it is a moment not a lifetime i have tr i have needed to remember that quite often as a parent keep it short and do not repeat yourself i know it's very hard so that means that i want you to keep it to three things that when you are talking to your child about something, you prepare the three most important things you want to get across. No matter what thing that they say to distract you, to irritate you, to confuse you, you are going to say these three things. You will die trying to say these three things. 
okay? So you keep it to three, you keep it short. I think most conversations with young people, unless they want to talk to us more, should last like three minutes, maybe four. And you don't repeat. And if you hear yourself repeating, and I've just recently did this, I said, I'm repeating myself. You are not listening to me. I'm going to remove myself right now. So these three are very important. Do not be peer pressured. This is particularly maybe important for you all, which is that you get to, if you are new to the community, you're like, well, what are the customs and norms of the community? And my child is telling me that everybody does X. I need you to remember who is the messenger here. What is their incentive? Their incentive is to get whatever it is they want from you. So they're not necessarily lying, they're just being convincing in their minds. So don't be peer pressured by what you perceive to be the norm of other parents. This is particularly true for those of us in upper, who have upper school people, right? Like, oh, everybody's having parties. No, they're not. Well, that parent doesn't care about us drinking. Uh, I'm not gonna assume that, right? Don't take your child's word for it. Remember who the messenger is. They're not necessarily lying. They just have a particular argument that they would like to convince you to agree with. It's different in their minds, very, very different. Um, have a theme song so you do not give up. So uh, truly, I have a theme song. When my children are exhausting me, I hear my theme song. I like put my head on the table. I'm like, I will not give up. I will not give up. They might kill me, but I'm not gonna give up. I will make these people decent human beings. I'm gonna do it. So you need a theme song. Do, do I need a theme song. Now, you, if you are parenting with someone else, you can have disagreements, right, about how things go, like, like details of stuff. But at the same time, United Friends have to be about what are the most important things that I want my child to learn from me. So if you're having disagreements with your person you're parenting with, sit down if you can and say what, like each individually go away for a few minutes, give yourself 15 minutes and come back and say, and share with each other, what are the things, the three things that I want my child to learn? Like from our family, from me, from us as parents, what are those three things? And then everything comes from that. All right, now we're gonna do some sentence stems. So this is stuff that I share with the teachers. This is equally relevant for you all. Child comes to you and says, the kids are bothering me. You say some variation of, can you just talk to me a little bit? Like, make sure you, I understand what happened. So can you give me a little more details or specific so I understand it better? Most children, most, are gonna start talking to you in generalities because they're sort of putting their toe in to see how you're gonna react because they don't want you to freak out. Now freaking out could be you raise your eyebrow, right? And you're like, oh, they're totally accusing you of freaking out. And you're like, I didn't even, you don't even know what freaking out is, right? <laughs> like I am behaving so well right now. So they, what they're doing is they're just step, put their toe in to see like how you're gonna react. Do you need to understand what happened? So ask them something of just like in your own words, like what are the details that I need to know? For the child, if you have children who give you way too much details and you're thinking, oh my gosh, like could you please just get to the point? I would, I would suggest that let them go for like a minute or two and then say, what are, I'm a really big believer on the three, what are the three things that you want me to understand from this situation? I want you to stop talking and I want you to just breathe and I want you to think about what are the three things you need me to understand about this situation? Because if they're talking like this with you, with like constant contact, way too many details, they're doing it with other kids. And that actually can be really irritating for other people. So that is, right, the, ch the kid who also says like, oh, me too, for everything, and then says their own story, that's also something that can pull kids away from each other. So uh, you also, I'm also saying this to you because I want you to have some inventory on your own child that you might think, oh, they might be doing this with other kids. And so that's, these are, you know, they're messy. Things are messy. My children were messy. And so it's really important to be able to see a little bit of like what they might be doing out, um, outside. Um, oh, by the way, if they're really good at convincing you of things, they're also good at convincing other children. What's next? Oh, here's the things I, here's a, a combination of things I think for parents that are important to say. So for teachers in the room, this is a variation on the theme. I'm so sorry that happened and thank you for trusting me is really for the most part, whenever a child confides in you, these, this is what you gotta say. 
because you're just saying thank you for trusting me because I'm an adult and I, you might be thinking I'm going to freak out. So I totally appreciate that you're doing this. So I am really sorry that happened to you, regardless of what you think happened. Do not start interrogating them on where, why, and when. If you just want to talk about what happened, I'm going to listen. If you want advice, I can give you my best thoughts. So you are actually helping your child develop skills about, because my experience with young people is that the vast majority of times with parents, they're telling you things because they want to get, they want to get comfort and they want to vent. They do not want you doing anything. The last thing they want you to do at that moment is to do something. So also, if you want advice, I can give you my best thoughts. So you're asking the child, like, what do you want? So you're developing their skills. And also you're saying, okay, you've now vented. And so now you can listen to advice better. We cannot make the problem magically go away, which is true. No matter how much money you have, no matter how much power you have, no matter how status, no matter how smart you are, I mean, you people, you cannot make these problems magically go away. You can't. So, but we can get you to a place where you have more control. And with young people, what I say is like, all right, well, what is, how miserable are you right now? Like 100%? And they'll say like 135%. Okay, so what we want is for you to go from 100% or 135% to like 120%. So we just want you to go in this, the right direction. So we can't get you from 100 to zero right away, but we can get you into the right place. So next is if, this is a big one for parents, a big one for teachers too. I'm going to tell you this, but you can't tell anybody. So this is basically the sentence stem. Remember, this has to be in your own language or else it's weird. I wish I could make that promise, but I can't. But I can promise if you tell me something where we need to talk to another adult, we can decide how to do it in a way that makes you the most comfortable. So it can be, again, super stressful as a parent. You see something on social media. Your child tells you something, and you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Here, like, but mom, you can't do anything about it. Dad, you cannot do anything about it. Doing, when they mean do, that means go talk to somebody else. That's what they're super, super freaked out about. So just bring, what we need to do is roll it back to this. Like, what happened? Why does it bother you? What do we think is the best way to move forward? So we need to slow this back. And when that happens, their anxiety goes from here to here. And the less anxious they are, the more they can think it through. And you can too. All right, what's the next one? Okay, so your child, you get super frustrated. We also went over this with the teachers. You have done your best to do all this good stuff and then your kid waits until the night before something or something has totally blown up and you're like, are you kidding me? Like, why didn't you, why didn't you tell me before? Well, totally understandable that you would feel this way. To oh, this is funny because many of you just actually dropped your heads. That's, I, that's funny, okay. So that's cool. We can repair. It's totally fine. Um, so here's the suggestion for what you can say instead. Whenever it feels better for you, whenever it feels right to you or better for you, I'd really like to know why you didn't want to come to me sooner. So for those of you who dropped your head, one of the things that I would do, and you don't have to do this right after this, because if you're, especially if your child knows you're with me, don't do this right after, because that's weird. So just like wait, just wait. Wait for an organic moment which will happen. The thing about parenting, of course, is we have moments. You don't have to do it like, unless their life is in danger, you don't have to do something right away. It will come to you. So wait, like, okay, say you're driving, you pick them up right here, right? For those of you, I'm gonna do two things in one time. For those of you who are asking your child a lot of questions when they get in the car, how was your test? How was this? How was that? How was your day? What was your positive? What was your negative? Da 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 da. Stop. Stop doing that. There are people like me who say, there, you can talk to your children in the car because they're trapped. Who likes to talk to somebody when they're feeling trapped? I mean, think about, like, think about what we do when we say that, okay? So when I, was, when, I was writing, when I was writing this book, this book, I had, I had high school boys, I had high school boys talk to me and they said, Rosalind, if there's one thing that you have to promise us to do is you have to tell my parents to stop interrogating me at the end of the day. Please, please tell them that. And one of the other ones said, can you imagine, and it was one of the funniest moments of my entire teaching. It's like, can you imagine 
if we were waiting for our parents at the end of a long work day, and we were waiting at home, and we had that beady eyes that my mom has, <laughs> and I walk in from a really, you know, she walks in from a really long day of work, she's got groceries, she's exhausted, and I'm waiting there for her saying, how was your day? Did you answer all of your emails? <laughs> well, what about that person who sabotages you at work? Do you want to talk about it? I read a book about you and how you deal with that. <laughs> so how do you want to deal with that? Wait, why are you going upstairs and slamming the door? You are being so moody. And I was like, <laughs> okay. So when we get into the car, all I want you to do is to just share some kind of expression of you are glad they exist. Right? Music is great, but you get to veto the music. You get to veto their musical choices because one of my children has abominable musical choice. Both, yeah, yeah, one mo mostly. So it's... I mean, I'm being recorded for this, and I'm wondering, is that accurate? Does my second child have bad musical choice? Is that fair? Like, is he going to see it? That's what's going on in my mind as I said that. You get to veto the music, because I really believe that that's also a values moment. You don't, you, like, truly, it's a values moment. They're going to listen to the music they're going to listen to, but it is also important for them to understand public space and also what you would, will not tolerate and why. So... Get into the car, you're expressing that you are really happy, just that you're pleased that they're in your life, that's it. And then the other part is, going back to this, as you can say a few minutes later, you know, I've been thinking about this thing. I've been thinking about this, 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 pro this thing I did that I need to talk to you about. And it's gonna be like, they're usually gonna be like, what? <laughs> and you're gonna say something like, you know, in the past there have been times when I've said to you, why did I wait? Why did you wait so long? And I've realized, I've been thinking about it, that actually you probably had a really good reason for that. And so, it, whatever you want to tell me, I'd like to hear it. But I also just want to apologize to you for doing that. You do, that's a literal. That's a 45-second conversation. If your child, God bless our children, if you have the child who's like, oh, my child, my my parents like being vulnerable right now, so I'm gonna try and get something from them. Like I want a new phone or whatever, like great, can I get a new phone? You say, good, try, good job, nice try, no. But I just do want to apologize to you about that. So I'm sorry about that and just move on. So those moments are really important, really important. And they might say like, it doesn't matter or whatever. To teachers, they often do that. Because we talk a lot, we talk a lot with teachers about that kind of thing. But those kinds of moments are short, but they're very important. Um, the other part is, is that just as an overall thing, if your child, your child for the most children wait for a long time to talk to their parents and to teachers. So one of the more, the things we don't want to say is just ignore it because the vast majority of children have been trying to ignore it for a while. So I just, you know, if that's the, and if you've done that, again, like, it's okay. We can go back and we can say, hey, I've thought about this and I just want you to know, in the past, I've said, just ignore it. And I'm, I just realized that, you know, if you have wanted to talk to me about it, you've probably been thinking about it. So I'm sorry about that. And if you ever want to talk to me, I'm going to be here. And that's it. You don't wait there waiting to have this, like, deep conversation with them. You just, and like, look, like, you just, you just say it and then you run away, right? You go do something else because it can be like, whoa, what's happening here? This is weird. So just let it be. You had a question. No, the answer is usually the same. I was scared of your reaction. I was scared of your reaction, right. So the que if your child says, I was scared of your reaction because you were going to freak out, <laughs> my answer to that is, okay, can you just, you can laugh and you can say, all right, can you define for me, can you, can you just tell me what it means? How do you define it when I'm, freak when I'm, when I'm afraid of your, why are you afraid? Because that's really important for me to know. That is really important for you to know. So you're listening. So the way I define listening is being prepared to be changed by what you hear. So when your child says something like that, there's gonna be a very understandable reaction to say, well, this is the reason why. That is not the time to do that. It is the time to say, okay, I need to listen because then you're, you're truly modeling what listening is, which is I'm not just hearing you and waiting for you to stop talking so then I, I can tell you why I'm right. It is I am listening to what you are saying. So that is an important moment. It also, it's just really important role modeling for the family too. And if you don't do it and you yell and you scream, because certainly I have, then you can go back. You can't keep going back, right? Because then it loses its power because then it means you're not really thinking about how to change your behavior. But you do get a right to make some mistakes here and be a human being, for goodness sakes. And so do they. Yes? Most of the time, I don't know what to say. I'm overwhelmed by this 
well. So I need half an hour to understand. I need another two hours to think about, it, think about it. And the purpose of this conversation, because most likely I don't have good advice. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, most of the time I don't know the answer. I need to consult and think and to read. The purpose of this conversation is to listen and to give proportion. What, what would you say? So remember I said a place to process and find peace, right? So when your the problems that your children can come with to you can be very complex. You need time to be able to figure it out. And I think it is, again, role modeling to say to your child, that's a really hard problem and I need to think about it. So give me two days or tonight or if they text you or something like that, if they are not physically in danger, if they are not physically in danger, you say, that's a really hard problem. When is a good time for us to talk tonight? And um, because that's really important. Thank you for telling me. And then when you get them later, what I would do is I would have your child sit down, depending on how old they are and how much this feels comfortable to them, because I can speak it or write it or even draw it, is what are the things that you don't like that are happening? Even if it's happening every day, what are the things that you don't like that are happening? What do, and I went over this with your, the sixth grade, the seventh grade, the, all of the kids. Um, what is it that you don't like? What is it that you want to happen instead? Then where do we have the best chance? If you want to talk to somebody about this, what's the best chance, where, where excuse me, is the best place to say that to somebody? Where do you have the best chance, the best success? The thing that happens is, is that student, young people can be really, we all can, be very focused on, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to do this. The advice I would give you is don't focus for your child on just say, we're not, we don't necessarily have to do anything. We don't have to do anything. We just have to prepare. And that means that maybe we don't do anything about this situation right now, unless someone's physical safety is at risk, but it's probably going to happen again. And so if we do, if we prepare, we're going to be that much better in the moment and later on how to handle it. And again, you're decreasing anxiety. If somebody's physical safety is at risk, then, and you're getting that information, then what you need to do, of course, right, what you need to do is go to the first, calmly, is just take 10 seconds, to, like just take a breath before you move and say, what is the best way to handle this? So you are going to the direct, the person, who is the best person in this situation to go to who's going to be able to handle this the best? So that's, it's just take a moment, just take a moment before you move. So, um, but that's, that's important about how you navigate through it. So what, what I want you to hear from me and from all of those words I just said is, your child's gonna focus on that they expect you to do something, that they, you expect them to do something. Your job in that moment is to get them prepared and working on increasing their skills. That's a very different way of approaching it and it takes the pressure off of them. And actually, what I, uh, I'm going to do a couple more things of questions. The things that I want you to, like, what the reality of this is, is that our world and our children across the board are more anxious. We are more anxious. Our children are more anxious. Wherever school I go, wherever I go, people are saying children are more anxious and anxious at more at earlier ages. So this, this is another reason why the wellness program at this school is so important and needs to be integrated in intelligent ways. And you have Colleen to be here. The school actually put somebody here to be able to help design, to architect that program. So if you are demanding high achievement from your, from your children, if you are doing that, then you really need to be aware of that they are being raised in a world that is 100% different than the way you went to school. And that is different. Levels of anxiety are different. The way you were taught is different. And the way in which a school has to handle that has to be different. So we want young people to be able to manage the anxiety that, they, that is around them. We want them to be able to be critically thinking through the process. We want them understanding the messages that are coming at them so that they can have some mastery and social competence around the process. If not, that is a real disservice to them. So you, with supporting the school to be able to do those programs is not just like, oh, nice and it's good and it's like nice to children. It is actually integrated into the capacities that they have to have. They have to have. I could give you all sorts of research about people who make more money who get along with people better. I can do that. 
honest to goodness. It is about do we want our children to be competent people who are decent human beings who can, I'm not joking about this, who can take care of us when we are old. And we need somebody who is competent and kind to hang out, to like take care of us. I'm taking care of my mother-in-law right now with my husband. It's hard. It is really hard. And watching my husband go through this kindness and competence, it's what is required constantly. So not, I don't really, it's like funny, but it's also as I'm getting older, it is increasingly not funny. So we really, this is a village moment. Uh, so it, in you, the way that you can support the school in this program, that is important. And that the school has taken this as a priority is important. Okay, couple of last questions. You have it? Yes, ma'am. That's okay. You can do it. Anxiety. This is what I'm hearing a lot now. This mm -hmm. makes me anxious. This and makes me anxious. Yeah. Please stop. You know, school requirements, all these high standards and all this thing. And most of us, we live in a kind of third culture uh, country. Right? Mm -hmm. They don't have the grandparents to turn to, you know, to right. complain you about all these things. Right. to look for kind of emotional um, support for the kids besides the family and school. Well, so pretty much, so the question is, where do you get support outside of family and school? But because so, grandparents, because because grandparents and your extended families, lots of times are not here. So um, I know I, I, uh, my mom was instrumental in helping me with my children. Um, instrumental. So here's my answer to you, which is not an awesome answer, which is their lives are school and family here. And maybe the companies that you uh, um, are working for, and those, are, those become your families to a certain extent, which actually means the reality is it puts more pressure on the schools to be able to uh, support those kinds of needs. And I think the school recognizes that, but the school also needs support to be able to do it. So parents demanding things like you know high test scores, getting into certain colleges, all of that stuff, even though I can tell you blue in the face, I can tell you blue in the face to lots of parents, no school is the exact perfect school for all children, that it's a right fit. All the, I didn't go to a fancy school. I went to Occidental in Los Angeles, small liberal arts school. Ob uh, President Obama went to it for about six months before he went to Harvard. I didn't go to a fancy school. We, like, the research is really, is really, really clear on that, about happiness and about all different kinds of things. And yet we are still so caught up in what does it mean to be able to be successful. And in fact, actually, I'm so glad you said this because I, I there's a really important tangent that I wrote in my note. Who here has junior? In, who here has juniors and seniors? I'm so glad you. Okay, I told the juniors and seniors in my little meeting with them because we immediately started talking about the pressure of college. That when adults come up to them at parties or socializing or whatever, that when an adult comes up to them and says, "So where are you applying?" We should not be saying that to our children because there are three reasons, as far as I can tell, that adults say that. One is small talk. They don't know what else to say. One is that they are um, actually interested in where the child's going because they're actually interested. Three is that they're comparing that child to whoever is in their brain. So it only increases the anxiety of the adult and it increases the um, anxiety of the child. So we need to stop having that conversation. So I told the, the seniors who I was talking to, that if an adult says that to them, they need to, with dignity, they need to say, well, where did you go to school? <laughs> and did you know, did you know what, what you wanted to major in when you were 15? <laughs> and so just, we just need to respectfully return the questions around. It might be a great conversation, you'd learn a lot, but honest to goodness, like we have got to realize what we're doing to children, what we're doing, because they're onto us. They know what we're doing when we say that. So that is a culture village moment that you can change. Your kids can apply to very difficult schools and not have those conversations and you will decrease anxiety. So in answer to your question, it puts more, it gets more gravitas for the school and all international schools to do this. And that is a reality, which is why those kinds of programs and why us working here and giving things to the school to continue is so incredibly important. Okay, yeah, last question. Um, I was talking last week to a friend, uh, friend's son, who last, um, whose eight-year-old daughter was pushed down and kicked at the school. I, I'm wondering if you can recommend. Uh, my daughter is in tenth grade now, so I um, don't know how to deal with this at, the, at this age. Is there a book that you can recommend about which part? Help, um, to, for, for, for who? More than the question. That, for, for this, this 
um, son of a friend mm -hmm. dealing with his daughter's situation at school. Mm -hmm. So here's uh, what I do in those situations is I need to take a lens out because there's a lot of things that can happen in those situations. So what you're doing, so that has no context, right? I mean, there's, you're selling to me shortly, right, in a short context. We, you have to understand the context, even though it seems so simple, girl was pushed down, kicked. You have to understand the context, which does not mean that I'm excusing the behavior. It means if you want to address the situation appropriately, effectively, you have to understand the context. So what, so what happened? And who reported that? And who saw it? And it's, so when we understand more the complexity of that, and it does the, does the, has the child gotten up and said, that's not a big deal, and truly believes it, or really needs help? Because children need to define it, and they need to define it for themselves in a way that is honest for them, authentic for them. Understanding that there can be pressure to not be honest, right? To hide, to cover, to whatever. So in answer to your question for the child, there are questions, there's a woman who writes books for eight-year-olds named um, Trudy Ludwig, who's great on these kinds of things. Like sort of like more, yeah, I think she's great. It's Ludwig, it's L-U-D-W-I-G. Um, and then um, for skills and strategies of like resilience and things like that, I mean, like there's actually some really good books over here. Um, I mean, I, I'm funny that like my books are over here, but the, um, <laughs> but, um, well, da, 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 da. Which one is the one that I was looking for? Um, uh, okay, wait. I'm actually gonna. I'm actually gonna pull. Okay, for those of you who have college kids who are obsessed with college, especially girls, Rachel Simmons's book "Enough as She Is" is amazing. Um, and um, "Tangled" by Lisa Demore um, would also be good in answer to your question. Okay. Yeah. All right. So here's what I want to leave you with. Um, so remember, OK, so we're going to go past this because I wanted to see where you all wanted to be, uh, where you wanted. Oh, just, just remember if your child does get, if they're guilty of something, just give them a window to remember because sometimes it's hard to admit all the yucky things that you did in one time. So I give, and they're also trying to figure out how much you know. So just give them a window to remember. I give them four hours or overnight. Yes, they can go talk to their friends and group tax and da da da, da all that stuff. But it's, it just gives somebody a little bit of time to remember. Like, and so what I say to them is, OK, you got four hours to remember anything that will help me with this situation. And it, after that four hours, I will, I will consider what you're talking, you're, that you've been lying to me. right? But before that, we have a grace period where you can come back and say, oh, yeah, the reason I pushed that girl down the stairs, right? Oh, yeah, I forgot that I did that. <laughs> I forgot, right? So give them a window to remember. Um, and so, um, and then for, for older kids, I also, not for older kids, but basically what I say is, because they're so worried about reporting, is I say, if the life of the kid who reported this gets more difficult, then you and I have a whole different level of a problem. Because that's really important, because they're, kids are so worried about reporting, and so, because they don't want to get fallout. So parents can actually take initiative on this and say, the thing that you did right here is crappy, that's bad, and we're going to discipline on it, that's important to me. And if you go after that kid because they reported you, that's a whole, really, that's a different level of a problem for me. Like, really. So that's an important um, uh, uh, clarity. OK, so I'm going to go through that. This is, I can give these things to you, because I wasn't sure where you would go. But what I want you to do before you go is I want you to remember. So remember, place, of, to, place to process and find peace. So what I'd like for you to do is just take a moment. I did this with the seventh and eighth graders. They actually did it, which was awesome, was just take 10 seconds to just quietly remember something you thought during this presentation that you want to remember like 15 minutes from now, right? When all these emails come and you go to work, blah, blah, blah whatever, like just 15 se 10 seconds. And then the last thing I want you to think about is, because you know, you all might possibly go out for coffee or wine at some point, or beer at some point. And so if you do that with your, with your cohort, with your friends, with people, with, with you know, people at the school, these are really important questions to ask. So what do we value? What are our village agreements? And that's what we've been doing at this school, is talking to the school about what are the agreements? And what we have done with other international schools is sat with them and said, with the parents, with the administrators, with the teachers, with the students, what are our agreements here? No matter who comes to the school, what are our agreements? And from those agreements, everything else comes. 
And these are the books that I used. Look at that. Right, that's Rachel's book. These are the books that informed this speech. Anna's book is really good on social media. It's comp Dana is brilliant. This is the book I wrote with boys. This is for high school boys. Um, and if you would like to get more stuff from us, you can get stuff from us by doing that. So here's what I, how we're gonna, I'm going to leave you today. So I want you to think about when you leave here today and you're driving away, remember the thing when you see your kid today and you're, like, and you're quiet. You're like, why are you being quiet? Um, just, I just want you to like, think about when you are with your child, this, these relationships are always repairable. You can make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. These, this is, we're in relationship. And so we are in a relationship where they are being repaired and we're going to make mistakes and we're going to repair and we're going to make mistakes. And so you are in a school where they have that similar mindset. And so together, it's going to be messy. It will be messy. It might have already been messy. But together, you are going to be able to do this because you really do have the foundation to do that. And so I want you walking out of here rest assured that that is the case. So thank you very much for all of your time. And thank you to, this, to ISP. Thank you, Teresa. Just to close, we want to thank you again for coming. We really do appreciate the conversations that we have together and us working as a village. So thank you so much for taking this valuable time. I want Jay just to say a few um, words about the books up here, because she always brings relevant books that you can check out on the spot. So a quick note from Jay. There's a lot here to look at kind of generally in this area. Many of the books she mentioned up there are either here or in the library. Um, please stop by and look through them. And of course, yes, we'll check anything out that you want right now. So thank you. And Rosalind will be here for about 15 minutes if you want to chat. But then literally, we're taking her to the airport. So thank you for coming. And we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.